cool. Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone, I, I think we're live now, so I'll, I'll get started. Um, thanks for joining. So today I'll be presenting on uh, my master's research, um, which was accelerating infrastructure development through visualization, um, well, through automation of the visualization stages during infrastructure uh, development. So that's me. <laughs> um, I'm currently uh, based at EY in the Sydney office within the data and analytics team inside of consulting, uh, specializing in geospatial data science. Prior to joining EY, I was in the engineering design um, industries, and I worked there for about three and a half years. And that's where I completed my um, master's of science uh, uh, majoring in, in geospatial science while I was there, which was where I um, completed uh, this master's that I'm going to be talking about. So today I'll go over the kind of overall problem uh, statement that I was trying to solve, the proposed uh, solution that I thought of, the technical aspects, which involves the FME workbench, including the inputs and the test case study that I used to validate it as well as the outputs uh, that were produced and some of the challenges that I found throughout that um, and then some potential next steps that uh, we're exploring at the moment or, or keen to explore um, in the future. So to start with, um, th this is the kind of overall, the first kind of problem statement that, that drew my attention while I was in the engineering design industries. And, just mainly around construction productivity. So in the last 50 years, construction productivity has decreased by almost 20%. And um, that's obviously causing a delay in projects and increasing the overall cost of construction. So as an example, Auckland, New Zealand has experienced a 45% increase in population growth from 1996 to 2016. And the estimated shortfalls for Auckland's housing stock during this time was between 40,000 to 55,000 dwellings because of poor sustainable management of the population growth and the construction productivity. Is. So the overall problem statement that I broke down here um, and how I came on to this uh, proposed solution, I broke down the infrastructure development pro process. So obviously, uh, broken into, you've got the scoping of what's proposed, the feasibility and due diligence, commercial negotiation and procurement, project development execution, and then you've got the financial close. Um, so the AEC industries sit across a few of these. However, the engineering design and construction phase, um, and then obviously where that construction productivity issue is sitting, is more around the pro project development and execution and so my overall thoughts if i come into the um, proposed solution was around if i can automate parts of the visualization stages um, during engineering design target at various stakeholders during the engagement process hopefully i can accelerate the overall uh, process of infrastructure development we can get to that construction phase quicker and potentially um, increase that that productivity of the overall um, infrastructure development as well. Um, important to keep in mind that, so on the right hand side here, we see a um, view of the infrastructure development process. And although this is just aiming to accelerate one uh, minor part of the engineering design process, um, the engagement process, but more specifically the, the visualization stages of the stakeholder engagement process. Hopefully we can improve engagement, um, 
improve buy-in, accelerate buy-in. Um, the, uh, the overall engagement process can be accelerated because of the visualization process is quicker. We can get feedback from the stakeholders uh, a, a lot faster. And so when I say stakeholders in regards to um, infrastructure development, I'm talking about the internal project team. So if there's the engineering design team, the architects, <clears throat> I'm talking about the client. So who's actually, um, you know, who's the client of the infrastructure that um, the consultants are developing. And then there's also the community. So who's actually using the infrastructure development and the overall proposed solution aimed to accelerate uh, the buy-in uh, of all of those stages from all of those stakeholders by um, not only accelerating the process of the visualization, but also increasing buy-in by being able to develop uh, more targeted visualization applications for stakeholders' uh, purposes. And so I'll go into more detail in that as we go on. Um, the overall FME workbench design um, is here. So it's, it's quite high level, uh, as we can see, but essentially the aim was to be able to input a geo-referenced BIM model, um, clean up the BIM model, create a study area from a user-specified buffer distance, um, which would go off and obtain all of the uh, near map aerial imagery within that buffer distance. It would obtain the latest uh, digital elevation model within that area of interest. And it would also generate 3D buildings um, within that buffer distance as well. And the output would be, uh, there were four outputs that you could choose from. So you could pick one or you could pick all four. Um, and so that was the uh, augmented reality output using FME's AR writer. There was a virtual reality environment using the OBJ output. And then there was a GIS output and that was a geodatabase multi-patch file. And there was, you could also output a Minecraft world as well. Um, one other thing before I go on, which is important to keep in mind, is that these outputs were focused on the data. So they weren't, um, the, this workbench essentially aimed to automate the generation of the um, data inputs in order to create that application. Um, this doesn't, it's not a full automation from input of the Revit BIM model to having a fully rendered VR um, application ready to take to clients, for example. So the first step was to kind of automate that data generation. And then the next step would be to um, upscale the rendering um, and improve the application and, and go from there. Um, and the reason that I chose all four of those applications as well was again, as I mentioned earlier, in the hope that each of those um, outputs could be aimed at a different stakeholder group. Um, and I'll go over that in a bit more detail here. So here I break down like the, the model input and by model input, I mean the, the data input into the application that would be developed. So for example, the FME um, augmented reality application um, so the target stakeholder for that uh, was the client. And so the initial thoughts around that would be that the client can easily kind of access the FME AR model through just like a mobile device and drop it on a table if, if we needed to update on um, progress or, or development of the model. And that contextual data and surroundings rather than just showing the BIM model, I think is really important. Um, you're able to get a better understanding of the project, um, the effect that it's going to have, where it is, um, and just to improve the overall contextualization of that. Um, and you can see that in the purpose. It's accessible in an immersive application on a mobile device. So um, that was the kind of key selling point there for the AR application. The virtual reality um, 
OBJ data. So again, it's the OBJ data that's going to be input into the VR build. Um, the rendering is still going to need to be uplifted a bit, but the data is all there um, already and everything. The target stakeholder would be the client and the community. So um, the immersive side of things, and, and I think uh, those that work in the kind of um, engineering design industries would be across like the, the client and the community seem to be the ones that appreciate the kind of immersive experience um, a bit more. And, and that's where we find that um, engagement increases a lot through that. So the, the third one was the GIS output. And so there were two outputs that I tested, which I didn't mention on the other slide, actually. So there's the geodatabase multi-patch as well as the ESRI I3S service. Um, and so the model input for that was a, an easy to use web scene. So the target stakeholder was um, thought to be the internal project team. So having the ability to send a web link um, to some of the internal stakeholders um, and internal project teams, if there's been any updates or potentially uplifting the um, functionality of that kind of like 3D web application as well to ask for feedback on design from internal stakeholders as well. Obviously something like that would replace the engineering software, but it is more of like that centralized view um, of the dated model. Um, and obviously it's that contextual surroundings data again as well. The Minecraft world um, data output was just kind of a fun way to visualize infrastructure development, to be honest, but um, I thought that it could potentially help increase engagement from some of the younger members of the community during infrastructure development. Um, that's, a, that's a key thing that I think um, sometimes when uh, engineering design and uh, consultancies are doing community engagement, sometimes the younger members of the community don't necessarily engage um, as much as um, potentially older members. So that could be a really good way to kind of initiate that engagement or even potentially to increase engagement as a whole, a, a fun way to visualize new infrastructure in the, in the community. Um, if younger members are drawing their, their family in because they see this cool way to kind of visualize um, infrastructure, it could, could be a good way to get them on board. So the, the case study that I used for my masters was Puanui Rail Station Interchange. So I got um, permission from uh, Auckland Transport to use this in another um, BIM model during my studies. Um, this was initially in development when I did it. I, th I think it's completed now if there's anyone from Auckland in the session that has used it. Um, so that was the overall input uh, BIM model that I tested on. I don't, I'm not going to show videos of that. There is another uh, video that I'm going to show instead. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the video that I'll be showing is the... Um, City Rail Link um, building um, in the city. I think it's the, the old post office building. Um, I developed this FME server app uh, towards the end of the master's research just to make this workbench accessible um, and, and easy to use by users. So essentially this application users could come in, uh, drag and drop a Revit profile here. Uh, they could specify a study area. So that was a dynamic um, a dynamic attribute within the FME workbench. So that could be changed and, and the study area would get bigger or it get smaller if, if we wanted to see a larger amount of contextual data. Um, visualization output. So if the user didn't pick anything, it would generate all of them. Otherwise they could pick just the GIS one or just the Minecraft one um, or, all th or three of them or, or just two, for example. So I think this was really, this is a really useful way to um, 
generate that contextual data. So the the um, the initial state of generating it is kind of going to a few different teams, um, asking like sending a, a Revit file manually. Um, users have to go away and kind of not not only the conversion of that Revit file, but it's the generation of the topography, draping that draping the aerial imagery over that. It's the finding of the 3D buildings, adding those, extruding them, sending them through. Um, and I think we, I took that task down from, I think it was about uh, uh, 40 hours. So for one person to do that, all of that um, in one week. So, and now it's fully automated. There's no resources required. And I think the workbench takes an hour to run um for that like the 40 hours in one hour can't really be compared because th that one hour is passive time so there's no there's no one kind of manually generating or working on that you can drag and drop hit run go away um and it'll get emailed the result will get emailed to you which is quite handy or the, the link will get emailed to you so that was a good way to kind of not just do develop the um, the workbench and and leave it, but to actually make it available um, to users. So the second case study uh, that I'll be going over today. Um, oh, sorry. So this is the initial Puanui interchange case study. I have screenshots of this output. So top uh, left up here, we've got the. Um, GIS output. Um, so this is just shown with an ArcGIS Pro um, scene in the de desktop application, um, just showing the, the data. Uh, we've got the Minecraft here down below. So fun way to for users to kind of interact with that. And down here, we've got uh, the, the OBJ within, um, I think that's Unity or Unreal Engine. And you'll see what I mean when you look at this, like I, d I didn't want to do anything with any of the data or update any of the renders. So this is just a drag and drop of the of the data within the application. Obviously still needs to be tweaked a little bit manually to take it to that next level for um, that, that VR applications do. But um, it, like the, the automation of that data was kind of the, the purpose of, of this. Um, the augmented, the FME AR output here. So I've just dropped that on a table and that's, those are screenshots from a mobile device. So that's really helpful, like being able to take that into a meeting, zoom in, like put that on the table in front of the client, zoom in, show some updates. You can actually toggle layers on and off within that as well. So the workbench automated the distinction or, or kept the distinction from the BIM model, um, the breakdown of the various elements from the various um, disciplines as well, which was really good. So um, yeah, found that really helpful to actually be able to go inside the, um, the BIM model and switch off some of the layers. I'll go through a few um, videos now for, for each of the outputs. So this is a, a case study, second one, as, as I mentioned. So it's the Britomart CRL um, building. Uh, we can see that within uh, GIS here. So we've got the contextual buildings um, in the buildings. Here, yeah, so this is what I mentioned around the, the BIM uh, model still being um, separated, which is really handy to get that next level breakdown. Again, with this, this is a drag and drop of the data. So we would still need to update that symbology um, and stuff like that for to align with some of the, um, you know, the actual elements of that. The way that the buildings were generated as well, the contextual buildings, so it just found the building footprints draped them over the digital elevation model and then found the height difference between the digital elevation model and the digital surface model. Um, and so this is quite handy for being able to see the, the tunnel underneath. 
I'll move on to, so this is the Minecraft version of the same output. So we've got the, um, the city rail link building again. And so this, we can actually tell the FME workbench what, uh, what elements of the BIM model, uh, what blocks, so what Minecraft blocks, sorry, we want to apply to different elements of the BIM model. So all of the contextual buildings here are, I think they're just like wooden blocks. Um, all of the windows we could say were glass panes within Minecraft and stuff like that. So you can really break it down to, again, keep that separation between the architectural, structural, and um, stuff like that um, breakdown of the BIM model. Users can interact with it as well. And so this is a demonstration of the AR model. Again, planted on a table so you can zoom in. As you can see what I mentioned, like breakdown of the um, different elements. Yep, and kind of, yeah, zoom through the different um, areas there. Turn off the aerial imagery if you want. If you don't need the contextual data, turn everything off like is, like what's, what has been done here and just look at the, the BIM model as a whole. And then the last one is the VR one. So before I play this, uh, disclaimer, um, as I mentioned, I just wanted to update, like drag and drop the data in here. It doesn't look the greatest um, because it does need to be cleaned up with the rendering and stuff like that. But the overall purpose of this workbench was to just automate the data generation. Um, the overall kind of full application automation, um, I'm not sure on the scale of that. I wasn't prepared to do it <laughs> in the time frame. But it still does help, um, obviously, accelerate that process, um, allow us to, to start um, a few steps ahead of, in the process of developing a, a virtual reality environment. So the overall um, results, so this is just um, interviewing a few um, uh, professionals from the industry. So. The, the, question, the overall question was this geoprocessing workflow could accelerate the overall process of infrastructure um, development. And I think it was 90% yeah, strongly agreed and 100% of the people with 10 plus years experience strongly agreed. 10% um, uh, were neutral about it. So yeah, pretty good results, I think, there around accelerating um, the overall accelerating of the infrastructure development. And then I'll go through the others and then can start answering some questions. So there's just two slides left. If you have any que questions, comment them in the chat and I can get to them soon. Um, some of the challenges that I found or have tried to kind of keep in mind throughout the development of the workbench was availability of data. So that's a really important one, um, obviously. Um, for New Zealand, where I developed the workbench for, uh, we have a lot of really good, like publicly available data through LINS. All of New Zealand um, building outlines, for example, there's uh, digital elevation models and, and digital surface models. Well, quite good coverage, not for all of New Zealand, um, but quite strong coverage for the main the main cities as well as aerial imagery um, to take this to the next level to be able to be used uh, within Australia um, we there would be a bit of um, further development required in terms of breaking it up by state um, I think this I think the states have different um, data openly available data sources um, or I'm still kind of figuring that out since since moving over here anyway. 
um, the reliability of the data. So, so obviously, where is the data coming from? And then the time spent scaling up the data for um, the application um, development. So, so that's quite an important one that uh, didn't actually get to test. So, and and what I actually mean by that, and that's kind of mainly just relevant for the uh, virtual reality application, is that is this automation of the VR data, is it actually um, creating more work for the user to fix up and get to the next level um, uh, in terms of rendering and stuff like that? Or is it, or is it going to help and there's, and there's kind of no difference that is, that is being produced? So that was quite a relevant one that we, um, yeah, that we needed to, to test essentially. Um, but unfortunately, I, I didn't get time to look into that one. Other use cases and next steps. So I thought that this this workbench would be quite useful for for digital twin development, for example. So um, something that would be quite useful to build into that workbench is what if every time someone uses it, there's a copy of that that BIM model. Um, maybe it notices when it's the final version. Um, and it's uploaded to, to something like uh, GIS, some online GIS, whether that's Cesium or, or something like that. And it's just a um, conglomerate of some of the um, BIM projects that we're working on across, across New Zealand or across the Australian states, for example. Um, and users can come in and, and you've got a digital twin of the, of the BIM models that we've worked on um, recently potentially full application automation. Um, so obviously there's no, I don't think, well, there is the, I think there's now the Unreal or the Unity writer, one of one of the two, um, which would be quite good to look into um, instead of the OBJ. Um, so, so that might uh, help with that, the application automation. And then a more streamlined process to integrate other data sets. So, interactive 2D data sets, for example, in the, um, in the GIS web scene um, and, and stuff like that could be quite handy in regards to other asset data. Um, I, think, I think that's it from me. Um, I, I'll, I have seen a couple of questions in the chat that I'll try and quickly get to. Um, so the first one, does this BIM contain layers of the assets and asset attributes and ability to select particular asset. Yeah, so the your second part of your question, ability to select particular assets in regards to the doors and windows. Um, yes, it does. So that, that breakdown that I showed um, within some of the videos, I think you would have seen like you can select to turn on and off um, architectural window, for example, architectural door, turn off and on those layers. The asset data, um, in the attributes did come through. Um, I didn't actually click on any of them in the videos, unfortunately, but the asset attributes did come through as well, which was really good. And then the last question from Kaz um, is just around, did you use a point cloud format for writing out to Minecraft? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a good point that I forgot to mention. So essentially I had to, for the Minecraft world, um, generate everything and then convert it to a point cloud but keep the attributes um, from the initial model so so that the point cloud knew what was a building um, what was an architectural window and stuff like that so that I could then say for all of the points within that point cloud make the buildings a wooden box for example and stuff like that um, the second part of your question, Kaz, also found an existing custom transformer for converting GIS data to Minecraft blocks. Um, no, I, I didn't use that. I, I created my own process, um, but that would have been helpful <laughs> to find that transformer. Um, unless there, yeah, unless there are any other questions. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, and my email is here in case there are any other questions or that pop up or you have any other ideas on, on that workbench as well. Awesome. Thanks.